Welcome, this is the Bay Area Books Festival in Berkeley, California. It's June 4th, 2017. My name is Mark Hertzgard. I'm with The Nation Magazine, and we are one of the co-sponsors of this event. This is the session on race and resistance in the Trump era. A few quick words about The Nation Magazine. It's the oldest weekly magazine in the United States, and it was founded by abolitionists. In the closing days of the Civil War in 1865, what is less known about the history of this magazine is that it grew out of a disagreement within the abolitionist movement at the end of the Civil War. Some, led by William Lloyd Garrison, felt that with the end of legal slavery, the work of abolitionists was done. And Garrison therefore advocated to close down the Liberator magazine the other group of abolitionists disagreed, and they were the ones who went on to form The Nation magazine. They believed that much work remained to be done, and furthermore, that writing and reading and discussing was a crucial part of that work for justice. So it's in that tradition that we're gathering here today. And since that time of 1865, I'm very proud to say as a uh, writer at The Nation, constantly feeling very uh, inspired by this fact. We've had some of the greatest thinkers and doers in this field writing in our pages. Giants such as Martin Luther King Jr., W.E.B. Du Bois, James Baldwin, uh, Amiri Baraka, and on and on, Toni Morrison, fiction, nonfiction as well. And so today, the session that I'm uh, very pleased to moderate here today with you follows in that same tradition. We are bringing together thinkers and doers, people who do the cultural literary work, people who do the organizing work, people who do the electoral college voting work, people who do the journalistic work. And we're gonna talk about how all of that comes together in this very fraught moment for our country. As we all know, we now confront a new president who gained office despite and in fact partly because, one could argue, of his unabashed racism. So what is to be done in this moment in June 2017 as we gather here in Berkeley, California? One of the advantages of working for a magazine that has 150 years of history is that we see today's events in a larger, longer historical context. But without for one instant forgetting what Martin Luther King Jr. called the fierce urgency of now. So let me now introduce our panelists. I'd ask you to please hold your applause until I've introduced all four of them. <coughs> to your uh, far left, here is Alicia Garza. You will know her, of course, as one of the co-founders of Black Lives Matter. And her book, uh, which is forthcoming, it's the working title. She wants me to emphasize that. It's not sure that it's going to stay the title. It's coming out uh, later this year from One World Random House. The working title is How to Turn a Hashtag into a Movement. <laughs> Directly next to her between us, Walter Mosley, one of America's greatest novelists, and I must say my own personal favorite novelist for many years now, uh, author of many books. Uh, most recently, though, a monograph, uh, a, a nonfiction book called Folding the Red into the Black, uh, or subtitled Developing a Viable Untopia for Human Survival in the 21st Century. Next to me, to your right, is Mr. Steve Phillips. He's the author of Brown is the New White, How the Demographic Revolution Has Created a New American Majority. And like Alicia, he is a local Bay Area guy. You grew up in San Francisco, I think? Uh, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio, home of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Yeah. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Now, you got, you, got, you got to bring that, right? Before you're even formally introduced. <laughs> and Alicia grew up in Marin. So um, Brown is the new white, Steve Phillips. And to your... Uh, this end of the table to your right is my other nation colleague, Joan Walsh. She's, of course, a commentator on uh, MSNBC. She is now the Nation Magazine's national affairs correspondent. And her book is called, latest book is called, What's the Matter with White People? 
We are definitely going to get into that, Joan. So um, I am so pleased and proud and honored to be able to call all four of these extraordinary individuals my colleagues at The Nation Magazine. So let's dive in here. Uh, and again, bearing in mind the, the history and the tradition of the nation and the role of, of writing and reading and discussing in these struggles, I'm going to go down the line here and ask each of you to name one or at most two books that have had an influence on how you think about race. And if you could, in a, in a brief way, relate that particular book to today's moment. Alicia Garza, could you be in? <laughs> Whoa, big question. How y'all doing? Good. Um, so two books. So one book in particular that I think has formed uh, a foundation for how I think about both race and resistance and movement building uh, is by W.E.B. Du Bois. And it's Black Reconstruction. Uh, and he's looking at what happened in this country uh, after the kind of devastation of the Civil War and the period where we were trying to uh, figure out how to do it better. And in that really comprehensive uh, narrative, which if you don't know, he actually wrote uh, in the basement of a library that black people were not allowed to use. Uh, he talks about uh, the, the ways in which, in particular, white working class people during that time uh, decided to form an alliance uh, with those who were more powerful rather than forming an alliance with those who had uh, technically just been emancipated, but certainly uh, with whom they shared many more uh, interests. Uh, and I would encourage you to read the book. It's like a zillion pages, but it's absolutely <laughs> worth it. Uh, and I think what's interesting about that book in particular is that it has resonance for today. When we talk about what it will take to form a resistance, not just to the Trump regime, but to Trumpism overall, right? Um, it's really important that we understand the role that race plays uh, in weakening our ability to actually have a functional, vibrant democracy. Uh, the second book that I would uh, just kind of name as foundational, although there's zillions, uh, would be uh, this book by uh, it's called, I'm sorry, uh, the book is called The Half Has Never Been Told uh, by Edward Baptist. And it is about the makings of American capitalism on the foundation of slavery and genocide. And in that book, he, d he details in, in uh, ways that I think are profound uh, all of the ways in which enslavement in this country and chattel slavery has literally shaped every, every bit of the foundation of this country, uh, whether it be through commerce, whether it be through our social relationships, whether it be through the ways in which our economy is structured. He really breaks down how those things persist today. And we today talk about slavery as if it's a thing of the past, rather than something that persists and endures today, and quite frankly, weakens the potential of what the promise of this nation is, which is freedom and justice and equality for all. That's Alicia Garza, co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement. Walter Mosley, one or two books. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I don't. I, I don't think I'm not. I don't. I'm not thinking like that. I might think like that, but I'm not thinking like that. But w w so what I'm going to do is I'm going to mention two people. Um, the the first is, is Gwendolyn Brooks, who uh, some years ago I was a long time ago I was, I was at her house with Haki Marabuti, if you know him, and, and we were talking, and and she and she turned to me and she said, you know, June Jordan called me yesterday, and she said, she wanted me to sign a, a petition. Uh, getting angry at the National Book Award for not giving Toni Morrison the award for Beloved. Now, of course, she deserves every award that you want to give her, but why do I want to beg those white people for their awards? <laughs> we need to have our own awards. And I was like, wow, okay. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, they didn't ask me to sign the thing, but I probably would have signed it, you know. But, but to have that, that level of thought. And the next thing was, I was, uh, I, I don't know, like, I mean, anybody who knows Mary Baraka, knew Mary Baraka, like, 
Listen, I mean, poetry just kind of leaked out of him. You know, it, it, he didn't have to be reading or writing a poem. One day, I, I was listening to him talk in a, in a small group somewhere, and he was, and he said, um, "It used to be, I could go down to the corner and listen to jazz. Now I got to go to another man's neighborhood and pay him to find out what I got on my own mind." <laughs> and 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 I think that. I, those are examples of, of how, in, in, a, in a pedestrian way, th that so many people do so much. You know, I mean, people who are not, who are, you know, who are not like, you know, uh, uh, necessarily leaders, who are not uh, people who are, who are, 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 are guiding a movement and, and, you know, mistakenly being called leaders while, you know, which is, you know, kind of decrements everyone else. But people who say, this is the way that we need to think about our lives, and this is this is the lives that we are facing, and you know, and I find that mostly with poets, and I and I really I really enjoy it, like because th what they do is they take the poetry out of everyday life, them Etheridge Knight, some really great people. That's Walter Mosley, Steve Phillips. Thank you. Uh, it's a great question. Um, I appreciate the chance to go third to think about it for a minute. Um, <laughs> but I think I would say two, the one is uh, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, which actually also invokes for me the current movie um, Get Out. And the pieces hmm. that hmm. I tie together in that in my mind, which I do think ties into US politics. And actually, I wrote a piece for The Nation in November highlighting the need for new leadership in the Democratic Party in this country, and how every single large entity that had budgetary control of more than $30 million, adding up to a billion and a half dollars that was spent, every single one of them was controlled by a white person. Hmm. And so the, the, the Invisible Man piece is this part where he's going, he, the, one of the, the guy gives him this letter, and says don't open this letter, but give it to all these different people, see if you can get a job, <clears throat> and then he eventually, somebody tells him <laughs> that the letter says, keep this nigger boy running. And it has always been in my mind, and that that to me does tie into this whole piece around get out and who actually has the keys and are people who are pretending to be your friends actually your friends and who actually has power and control. And so that has really shaped a lot of my thinking in one piece. And then related, another piece is, uh, James Baldwin, well, his constellation of writings on the, the price of the ticket, but in particular his essay around uh, Sweet Lorraine, um, about Lorraine Hansberry, um, and when she heard her first uh, uh, her success on Broadway, and I think I actually quote uh, Baldwin in my in my book where he has this statement about he had never in his life seen so many black people in the theater. And that is because black people had ignored the theater because the theater had always ignored black people. And so I always thought that was an excellent example of cultural competence. And when you put forward a resonant, powerful cultural message, people will respond and come out. And I, I do not think it's accidental to trying that in today's political situation and, and road forward that when we have had an inspiring culturally competent African-American on the ticket, we have won. And that that is, and that when we did not, we had a million and a half black people not come out this past year. So looking towards the future, I think there's lessons from both of those um, to, look, to learn from. Steve Phillips, Brown is the new white. Now, Joan Walsh. Uh, all right, I get to go last, which is great, but it's bad because I would have said uh, <laughs> Invisible Man. But instead, I'm gonna cheat and, and uh, talk about Taylor Branch's three-part trilogy on the life of uh, Dr. King. And there's so much about it that's important. Uh, but I think uh, what really came through to me, and, and I learned this again and again, uh, watching, doing the work we do, watching the work we do, uh, that we look back at that time and at those leaders as though they were incredibly, they were geniuses, they had all the right answers, they knew what they were doing, and progress just unfolded naturally and, and seamlessly. Uh, you know, with a bump here and there and, and you know, uh, dogs and fire hoses and lots of bad stuff, but that there was a through line. 
And you know, that was the first set of books for me uh, that really showed how hard the work was and how by the end of his life, as Dr. King became more radical, he was not the preeminent black leader and that he was really uh, struggling with both folks, I don't know if you want to say to his left, somewhat to his left, or uh, more on the nationalist side, and then you know, white liberals, li white liberal friends uh, who really treated him like a, like a pariah uh, after he turned against the Vietnam War. And so it, it really, I was too young to remember a lot of it. I remember him dying. Uh, but I, I really opened my eyes to the way I kind of uh, mythologized uh, black leaders of that era and maybe gave short trip to people in our own era because they, they didn't have the answers and they seemed flawed or I could tell what was wrong with what they were doing. And I thought, God, I might have been just a complete asshole if I were alive in the 60s. I don't know, I hope not. Uh, so, um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Taylor Branch. That's Joan Walsh. Uh, <clears throat> what's the matter with white people? Joan, you mentioned uh, Dr. King uh, and the uh, flack that he ran into after coming out against the war, and there's a Nation Magazine connection to that. I'm looking here in this. Uh, if you haven't got this, I commend it. This is the 150th anniversary of the Nation Magazine, and it has a lot of the writings of the people I've mentioned. Um, you know, in, we can go down the list of others, Langston Hughes, uh, who wrote for us, and Eric Foner, the great uh, historian. But, uh, and it has a, a sort of a timeline, and when Martin Luther King denounced the Vietnam War the first time, it was February 25th, 1967, at an event in Los Angeles sponsored by The Nation magazine. So we have been on that side of this argument, this tension, really, within uh, American politics around this issue. And of course, now we've reached uh, a moment with the election of 2016. Uh, and let's talk about that just to sort of place us in this moment. Of course, uh, Donald Trump won about two thirds of white male votes. He won 52% of white female votes. Uh, so he was essentially, it was white people who uh, more than any other predictive factor, that was where you could see the, the victory. But the problem is deeper than that, as the four people up here well know, that a majority of white people have voted for the Republican Party for the last 50 years in the presidential elections ever since the passage in 1964 of the Voting Rights and 65 of the, of the Voting Rights Act, upon which Lyndon Baines Johnson, then the Democratic president, said very famously, we, meaning the Democratic Party, just lost the South for the next generation. Well, President Johnson underestimated. The South has stayed white dominated for two generations now. So we're going to talk about electoral politics specifically later. We've got two of very strong experts here on that. But before we get to that, I wonder if we could kind of set the stage. And Alicia, I'd like you to start with this. Um, for the larger question of race in America, when we look at this 2016 outcome, clearly something's broken. But what does that say about the larger question of whites and blacks m working together and other non-white uh, 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 Americans, is common cause still possible? Can we come to a place of pushing <clears throat> progress forward? And if so, how? I mean, it's a simple but complicated question. The basic answer is we have to figure out how to do it. Uh, but the complication in it is the question of for what? And so, uh, of course, I think that if there is to be a functional democracy in this country, then we have to figure out what connects us and we have to stop being afraid of what is different about each of us. Uh, and I use the word afraid very intentionally. I don't use it flippantly. I think that fear is something that really drives uh, the Trump agenda, it drives Trumpism, and it drives um, really this notion that somebody's out to get what you deserve and they're getting things that they don't deserve, they're not working hard enough for, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is really what has consolidated people around things that don't actually make any sense in terms of saving our lives, saving the life of the planet, um, or creating a world that is more equitable. The other thing I think gets in the way, though, is that we tend to not go deep enough in terms of a few places. Uh, one I just mentioned in my earlier answer, which is I think we still have a lot of reckoning to do. 
um, with how we came to be. And uh, part of what happens is that we erase uh, the genocide of indigenous people. We erase uh, the enslavement of African people in this country uh, from the narrative of how we got here. Uh, and so that means that it results in a narrative of who we are that is a lie. It's just false. Uh, and until we start to look that in the face with courage <clears throat> and bravery, we're not gonna move very far. Uh, and the reason that we have to look it in the face with courage and bravery is because to solve some of the problems that we face today, we have to be willing to live a completely different life. Um, and that means that for a lot of us who are sitting here right now, we're gonna be really uncomfortable. We're gonna be really uncomfortable. Uh, you know, it does strike me that uh, the, the kind of environment that I come up in uh, talks about alternative economic uh, strategies as things that are not only utopian, but they are things that result in people not having what they need. Uh, and in fact, I would want to flip that on its head right now and say, uh, it's time for us to start looking at different systems that don't involve profit at the expense of people's well-being, period. With that being said, uh, we did have candidates in this last election that tried to point to those alternatives, but did so in a way that completely disenfranchised black people, brown people, uh, people who um, are working class, right? We're, we, we in, instead of really diving into some of the complications of what it would mean to redistribute wealth in this country in an equitable way, we said, well, let's redistribute wealth amongst white people. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? Like, Let's, let's figure out how to do it differently amongst white people. Let's not talk about how it is that we redistribute wealth so that uh, people of color and women and trans people and gender nonconforming people and people with disabilities and people who are immigrants can actually survive and thrive in this country. Uh, so I, I really believe that uh, a, a deeper kind of unity is possible, but I don't think that we get there or do ourselves any favors by trying to sidestep this question of race. Period. Dot. Full stop. Thank you. Of course, <coughs> many of Trump's voters, of course, are uh, Fox News watchers. That was another big predictor of uh, how you would vote in 2016, subjected to uh, actually fake news on, on Fox. Um, but Walter Mosley, I know you have a couple of observations about fake news that oh, yeah. uh, maybe you could share with us. Can, can we move that a little yeah, closer? That's... I know it doesn't, yeah, that's, oh, that's good. I like that, yeah. Um, I, when he was talking, you know, I, I, was, I, was on this, uh, I was on this panel with these five journalists, you know, a few months ago. And, and, and you know, they were, I mean, it so happened they were all white journalists. But the guy interviewing us was a black guy. But, but, but they were talking about, like, fake news, you know, which, you know, I, I kind of want to talk about her question in a minute. But, but I want to say this first. That, that, and, and they were saying, you know, Trump is saying fake news, and Trump is saying fake news, and, and you know, we're all, like, you know, supposed to look a certain way and feel really bad about it and stuff. But I, I said, but, you know, I'm, I'm a black man in America. I've been, I've been dealing with fake news ever since we've been here. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I mean... Like the idea, you know, of that fake news can't exist, and that, and what can we do to support the the, the systems that exist that, that you know distribute news, you know, uh, through commercials, uh, is like ridiculous. I mean, it's like, yeah, it's fake news. It's all fake news. I remember Walter Cronkite talking to me about Vietnam when I was a kid, you know. But but I but I think the other thing is is that you know, like of course, it's a really hard question to answer about about um, about how you you solve things, and. I, you know, listen. If I had that, that answer, I wouldn't be here. I'd be somewhere else right now. But, but I, I, I do believe that one element of the answer is, is is a belief that I have. I, I do not believe in the existence of white people. I just want you to understand that all you people out there who think you're white, you have to ask yourself, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> like, how? I'm, I'm what? I'm, I'm white. You know, it's not like you're French. You know, it's not like you're Catholic. You know, it's not like you're a pygmy. I mean, I, I understand a pygmy, you know? But, but to say that, that you're white 
and then to believe it and not want to let it go and believe it no matter what, no matter how much you can say the, the physical things are different, the hair color is different, the eyes are different, the language is different, the religion is different, the culture is different, all of this stuff, you know, the, your, the bones are different. I mean, like they're at least in size, and and and. And the idea that as long as, as, and you know, and the same thing goes, like to say black people is like, you know, we're two black people here. You know, I mean, I don't know what that means. You know, I understand politically what it means, but I don't understand, like, I'm, it, it's, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's, it doesn't mean something deep and profound. One of the things is, is that, so as long as you have a group of people identifying on, uh, in, because of what happened with, with colonialism, these people from Europe came here, they had to kill the red people, enslave the black people, so they needed a color, you know? <laughs> so they took the color white. Not that anybody really is white, except in The Walking Dead. And, 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 <laughs> and, and, and so anyway, so that, that's, you know, I'll say full stop there. That's good. <laughs> that's Walter Mosley. Can you want to hop in on this? Sure. <clears throat> Go ahead. Steve Phillips. Oh, I'm, I'm uh, appreciating the uh, deficit that those of us who are nonfiction writers have to follow a novelist, <laughs> right? So, yeah, right. Um, but I guess I'll just say a couple things on the, on this. I must respond a little bit to what uh, Alicia said and also, also Wal uh, Walter. One of the things that is very uh, pronounced to me about the election is a, is a, is a couple of things. One is that it wasn't... You know, I've been making the argument that people of color and progressive whites represent the majority, and we should be getting out more people of uh, color to vote, et cetera. But one of the things I, was, I realized is that part of the problem also is the, this notion of colorblind politics, which progressives and Democrats hold to fiercely. And so you have an election where the Republican candidate was fiercely, unapologetically pro-white. Right. And then you had on the other side, a ref, uh, not a commensurate response to embrace the country's racial and cultural diversity, but an attempt to more walk a neutral line and continue to be colorblind. And that can, and there, there, I talk about in my book about the tyranny of the white swing voter. And I still think that's driving progressive and democratic politics after 2016. All of this attention is around Russia and this and that, which is all, I mean, if they can bring him down, fine. But where is the vocal, visible standing up around what's happening around immigration and people who are actually being uh, uh, deported from the country? Where are all of the national leaders flocking to Portland to stand against the racist uh, murder and attack that happened up there? Where are people echoing the uh, uh, mayor of New Orleans' effort to take down those Confederate uh, uh, statues? That's not a, a core, visible, leading part of the progressive response to this person right now. And so that's, I think, what I say on that point. And then there's the piece around this notion of whiteness. It is interesting well, what, to me, I mean, the advantage of actually taking the time to, do, to write a book and think about these questions and have that luxury is to really begin to think about it. And that the very first, we talk a lot about diversity and having more diversity, et cetera, but I actually think we need to talk more about whiteness and so it's not even just a question about why can't you hire more people of color, why aren't people of color, it's why are you hiring so many white people? And that when you turn it on, the, on its head that way, it begins to th realize like, oh, well maybe there's a preference going in that direction and realizing the duration of that. I mean, the very first immigration law in the history of this country in 1790, to be a US citizen, you had to be a free white person. And that was the explicit good law of this country up until the 1950s. And so this notion around whiteness is deeply embedded in the cultural consciousness. And until we grapple with it, we are going to have difficulty winning back the country. We're at the Bay Area Books Festival in Berkeley, California. This is the session on race and resistance in the Trump era, sponsored by The Nation magazine. I'm Mark Hertzgard. And we're going to turn to Joan Walsh here, but I want to set it up with a quote uh, I just read in the Guardian newspaper this morning a new book that's just come out in Britain and I'm sure it'll be coming out here titled Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. The author is Rennie Ado Lodge and reviewing it this morning in the Guardian, Colin Grant writes the following, quote, every black person I know shares the sentiment that white people would rather not talk about race and that they inevitably try to frame the terms of debate. 
Discussions about racism are often led by those who are largely unaffected by it, unquote. That's Colin Grant writing about Reno Edo, Edo Lodge's new book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. Joan Walsh, you are the author of a book with one of the most audacious titles I've seen in quite a while, What's the Matter with White People? So Joan, tell us, what is the <laughs> matter with white people that they elected this guy who, I mean, what do you say? Uh, it's time for a sequel. Because that book is five years old, uh, you know, I, I wrote it in twenty. I wrote it in twenty eleven, looking forward to twenty twelve. I wrote it before Barack Obama was reelected, but I talked about Donald Trump because I saw him coming and I saw him as a culmination of uh, the Republican Party's reliance on whiteness uh, and reliance on racial grievance that there just had become, you know, starting not not starting in the sixties, starting long time before that, uh, and and in Reconstruction. Uh, persistent efforts to divide uh, white people from people that they had more in common with, uh, and and privilege whiteness. I you know I love it when Walter says there's there's no such thing as white, but and I I basically agree. I also think that that lets a lot of white people off the hook. Some of the work that we need to do now is is for white people to think about what being white means and what it means to really try to cast your lot w with other with others and so you know in writing this book uh, I, I was asking the question of, of why white people in the 50 years uh, since uh, the, the advances of the 60s had increasingly gone over to the Republican Party and I did it through the story of my Irish Catholic family um, Half of which uh, went to, went Republican, uh, not so gradually, and you know increasingly, and then half of which stayed you know fairly liberal Democrats. Uh, and it was clear to me that the advances of the '60s really put some folks in my family in a kind of fear of you know we're losing status, we're losing stature, um, our wives are having to go to work. What the hell? You know that this was a great advantage of whiteness that you know the the one paycheck family was premised on white men. Uh, getting the advantage to raise a family and have a wife at home. Black men didn't get this. Um, and that there was also a lot of this, this mystique of uh, we did everything on our own. We worked hard to get what we have. It completely ignored. Um, I'm not going to go back to the founding and to slavery. I mean, obviously that's there, but even the the... the uh, post-World War II consensus and the deliberate decision to create a middle class, a white middle class, um, after the twin traumas of the Depression and World War II, where World War II was seen as, oh my God, fascism and communism are really winning over a lot of white people. Uh, and we need people, white people, <laughs> to have more of a stake in our society. So you have things like the GI Bill, you have highway construction, uh, you have the development of the suburbs with restrictive covenants. You have all these things that enable white flight, but white people to have the you know, house with the garage and the picket fence. Uh, that that you know the GI Bill uh, was enabled to discriminate against uh, black GIs. Uh, so many of these things either actively di discriminated against black and brown people, or just sort of went along with the prevailing system and they wound up discriminating. And white people didn't see that they had built wealth with the help of government, this government that they had come to despise. And when the government began giving little pieces to other people, suddenly they were our enemy, they're on the side. You know, all this research on the Reagan Democrats would find, oh, they consider the Democrats the party of black people. Full out, people would say that. They're not doing anything for us anymore, which is completely ridiculous. Uh, and so I tried to be as sympathetic as possible. You know, there, you did have, well, you know, you did have uh, stagnation of wages. You, you know, you had a lot of things happen in the economy right at the point where we were trying to get people to be more generous. But the under, so there, there are things that you can say, okay, you know, you're having you're having a hard time, white people. But the the, the reliance on uh, an idea that the people to blame are black and brown and women, brown people and women, getting more, and not a government that is increasingly privilege, privileging the wealthy, uh, 
it, it's why it's why we have Trump today, but it's also why we have the scourge of white poverty. And you know, I'm reading. I'll, I'll stop after this, but I, I, this just gets me going. The way that we treat the the epidemic of opioid dependence and overdoses and uh, you know, I think we should be very sympathetic to the people who are suffering. But, you know, so many people, left and right, are willing to say, oh, these poor people, there are no jobs, they're suffering from despair and depression. But when heroin overtook the cities in the 50s and 60s and 70s, or, or crack overtook the cities in the 80s, there was no, oh, there are no jobs, these poor people, let's get them jobs, let's get them medical care, let's treat it as an addiction, not as a crime. I mean, I do think Jeff Sessions, one good thing about him is he's going to bring uh, a lot of us together because I think he will treat he will treat the white opioid addict and and dealer et cetera uh, with harshness and Trump's Medicaid cuts will remove opioid treatment uh, from some of these communities that think that they're Trump fans. So you know the carnage we're about to see uh, I use that Trump word but this really will be carnage. Uh, you know again. With me, hope springs eternal. Maybe it will bring people together and see, oh my God, they're after both of us. They're after all of us. That's Joan Walsh, author of What's the Matter with White People. <laughs> Alicia, I wonder if I can um, bring you back to this quote uh, that I just mentioned, but also reference something you said in an interview in, uh, with The Nation here um, about, uh, you said that, you know, even blacks before uh, Black Lives Matter, the part of what was uh, instigating you, you said it was even blacks did not want to talk about race, did not want to talk about how we were, uh, you said, but Malcolm X said, be proud of who we are, be proud of our differences. And you said, Black Lives Matter wants <coughs> to, quote, celebrate what it means to be black, how we've survived and thrived through the worst conditions possible. So that's what you said. How do you react to this quote uh, and the book, why I'm no longer talking to white people about race? How do, how do we, uh, bridge that. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> See, all this is why we pay you the big bucks. Right now, apparently. <laughs> I wish that were really true. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the Nation magazine, you know. <laughs> Which, by the way, we hope you are all subscribing to the Nation magazine. Yes. That's why we can do this work. I mean, here's the thing. Uh, I, I feel fundamentally that uh, we have to understand that race is certainly more complicated than black and white, um, but it does operate on a black-white spectrum. And so when I talked about uh, the fact that there are black people that don't want to talk about race, that's absolutely true. Uh, and if we were to look at uh, the tenure of President Obama, he had a really hard time uh, being front-facing about the dynamics that still persist in this country. Now, I don't necessarily fault him for that. I think it's a it's a challenging place to be in. Uh, and at, at, on the one hand, uh, when you have somebody who is the first black president in the United States, and maybe the first black president that the US will ever have, uh, and you're being t told by your peers that you are a monkey, an ape, um, that you are a Muslim socialist, uh, when the entire Congress uh, uh, essentially kind of gets into this, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, this rigidity and won't move any kind of policies to help relieve the suffering of people because they are in opposition to a black man being in leadership uh, or in opposition to uh, Michelle Obama and her bare arms in the White House. I mean, these are things uh, that make it really difficult to be uh, the one person that talks about race because part of that narrative that was being told about Barack Obama was that he was only going to be a president for black people. And he had to make the point that he was going to be a president for all people, but it was silly that he had to do that in the first place. Uh, on the other hand, to be quite honest, um, Obama was not uh, somebody who, we're not, somebody, we're not people who share the same assessment of how race plays out in the United States. Uh, and when uh, police shootings became more visible, and I'm not, and what I'm saying here in 
intentionally is not that police shootings began in 2014 or 2012, right. but that they became more visible, thank you to social media and Black Lives Matter and, and all the people who made it so that they could bypass uh, media that wouldn't talk about what was happening uh, in an ongoing way in our communities for generations. Uh, he was really slow to respond, uh, and his response uh, was tepid, to be quite honest. Uh, his first response to the murder of Trayvon Martin, uh, as people are occupying the Florida State Capitol uh, and protesting and marching and trying to put pressure on the district attorney to file charges against George Zimmerman, you know, his response was, let's let the system work. Uh, and I think all of us can see now, hopefully all of us can see now, uh, that it's not just a question of letting the system work, because if we let the system work, that exact thing is what happens, right? People are allowed to murder black people uh, because fear is a legal justification uh, for murdering people uh, and murdering children, uh, like 12-year-old Tamir Rice, right? I mean, we could go on and on. Uh, with that being said, this question of, do I wanna talk to white people about race anymore? Uh, only if you're doing the work to dismantle it. I don't wanna have disagreements and arguments about whether or not racism exists. I feel like that train has left the station. And I don't, there's no, there's no amount of money in the world that makes that worth my time. Uh, I want to work with people who literally really wanna figure it out. And it doesn't mean that if you have questions or don't understand how something works or functions that we can't talk it through, but I don't wanna have the basic conversations that we're still having. Uh, this question, these questions around uh, why can't we talk about all lives or, you know, <laughs> um, these questions about, you know, there's a few bad apples in a sea of really good people. I mean, those are things that it's almost just saying like water is wet, right? So sure, um, you know, Barack Obama is a good person and I disagreed with him vehemently on a lot of his policies. Uh, sure, there are probably good people who are police officers. Um, I disagree with there being a pattern in practice, not just of discrimination, but justifications for treating large groups of people differently than others. Uh, and that's not up for debate. That's been well documented. Uh, so for me, um, I agree with this notion of let's put our energies in the right place. I do, however, feel uh, very strongly that white people need to talk to other white people about racism uh, because our conversation is actually coming from really different experiences. And I do think it's important to be able to uh, highlight the, the things that are invisible uh, and the ways in which we kind of move around in our everyday lives thinking, for example, that race isn't our problem. Um, racism is our problem, it's all of our problem, but in particular it's white people's problem because y'all created this thing. <laughs> um, and I'll say this, lastly, uh, I feel pretty strongly as well that it is important for us to really dig into uh, this question of whether or not uh, movements like Black Lives Matter are movements for white people. Uh, I get people telling me all the time, thank you for your movement, thank you for the work that you're doing, best of luck to you and yours. And I'm like, wait a minute, right. <laughs> wait a minute. <laughs> That's not how this works. Um, if Black Lives Matter is only a movement for and by and about black people, we're not gonna get very far. Um, black Lives Matter has to be something, and black liberation more broadly. I mean, if you don't like Black Lives Matter, fine, that's your business. But the business of black liberation has to be each of ours. We have to each take responsibility and ownership for it, because racism does impact white people, um, and it adversely impacts white people. And all we have to do is look in places like Gary, Indiana, or look in places like the Appalachia to show and see how racism um, and capitalism and patriarchy impacts white people. Uh, so uh, I, I, I wanna say that yes, we should stop having the basic conversations, have the courage to get into some of the more complex ones, but more than just talking, I think we need to start being courageous enough to do things to dismantle systems that privilege white people at the expense of everybody else. We're here at the Bay Area Books Festival in Berkeley, California. This is the session on race and resistance in the Trump era, sponsored by The Nation magazine. I'm Mark Hertzgard. Walter Mosley, in your new uh, book, The Folding the Red into the Black, you talk about uh, how to move society forward, um, getting past this 
this dynamic between capitalism and socialism. And we, you and I talked about this a little bit the other night. But race was not a big part of your analysis of, uh, of this kind of big, the big political shift. So I'm hoping in, the, in our final few minutes here before we go into questions, we can talk about this dynamic between the short-term immediate need to resist what's coming from the White House, the medium uh, need to prepare for the 2018 and the 2020 elections, and then the longer-term urgency of what, Alicia, you call building black power in this country. So, Walter, why, why was race not a part of, of the analysis that you put in this uh, new book? Um, that's, that's an interesting thing. I, mean, I, I, I wrote a book called Foley and Red into the Black, you know, and, and, and the, the, the notion of, of, of the book, it's a monologue, right? So it's not like I, I have the answers for everything, but, but, but it was thinking that, you know, you have the two big isms. You have capitalism, you have socialism. Uh, uh, each one left on its own without being mo moderated by the other ends up to be a kind of totalitarianism. That people, you know, uh, ev everything is taken away uh, uh, from, from the, the vast majority of people, regardless of who they are. I mean, it's just like, you know, uh, most white people I talk to can't retire either. You know what I mean? It's, it's, an, it's an issue that slowly that, that the, the wealth and the power it, it is migrating. And, 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 the, and though, you know, I, I write, I've written 56 books, but, but this one, when I, it wasn't about race because I, I, want, I wanted to talk about, about the isms, the, the, those big powers that exist behind uh, us all and the, and the guides and structures and also limits and depletes our lives. You know, and, and, and you know, the, and that's an important thing. I mean, you have to be able to think about, you know, like, you know, you say, well, is that a car that drives black people? So, man, it's a car. I, the car is going to take me somewhere. Now, there's a thing about race, and maybe people are not letting black people in cars and stuff like that. But it, there are moments when you when when you have to actually talk about the system and and work through the system. And you know, and, and I just want uh, to to add there is is that 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 you know when I when I'm when I'm talking about the fact that I don't believe in the existence of white people, it, it's because that that you know one of the the interesting things is you know for you know for many 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 years i was i would always think god you know we had our history taken from us you know and i have like two sides you know my jewish mother black father i mean the jewish side like you know, listen history memory that's everything that's everything and then i had the black side and i said well you know like there's like there's nothing here but you know i realized the other day that that black people at least know that I, we got our history stolen from us the white people in America have no idea. They think they, 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 think they know something, but, but there's nothing behind there. They just say, well, I'm white. I said, man, that doesn't mean anything. Right. You know? And, and so, so there's an idea that, that you, know, you have to talk about like, larger structures. You know? And also, just the final thing, when, when one says that black lives matter, the, the most beautiful part of that is we matter to America. With, without us, there's, there isn't an America. Mm -hmm. There isn't a potential for America. And there isn't a, isn't a future. We understand better uh, the oppression that's going on around the world more than anybody in this country, and more historically. And we're some of the oldest people in this country. We know the country better. And so, so you know, I mean, there's certainly there are terrible things, you know. But it's not just because of being victims. It's because people are not listening to the truth of what we know. That's Walter Mosley. <laughs> and what I'm hearing here. From this side of the table, both, both Alicia Garza and Walter Mosley have emphasized the need for systemic change, talking about capitalism as uh, something that needs to be replaced. And Steve Phillips and Joan Walsh, I, I'm going to let you speak for yourselves in a moment, but a lot of your work and, and your, your writing has been focused more on uh, electoral politics and the more sort of immediate aspects of politics. And this is interesting. It actually reflects a... Uh, two strains of thought that have run through the writings of the Nation magazine in the past 150 years. Radical, reformist, liberal, socialist. And that tension can be a, a useful thing, I think, and we see a little bit of it here. So Steve, as you, uh, you know, you make this very persuasive argument in Brown is the New White, that basically the Democratic Party should wake up to demographic reality and see that your true path to victory is to stop chasing the so-called white working class vote and run candidates who speak to the truth of the growing uh, non-white majority and a progressive white minority. So how do you, um, you know, in the aftermath of an election that saw the most outspoken racist, certainly in modern American history, get elected, how do you look at that argument? And could you relate it a little bit to what Walter and Alicia are saying about, look, we need much deeper 
structural changes than just electoral politics. Right. So I think these things go together in that uh, uh, in some ways that um, uh, the whole book series that you know Joan is mentioning, um, that Taylor Branch talks about, you see the intersection of a movement and electoral politics. And it's, it's important to appreciate that uh, intersection in terms of really understanding how to bring about change. And that that, frankly, is I think that, I mean, per se, I would, you know, was all in, big believer, still, you know, loved and loved Barack Obama. But I think we can have an open conversation around shortcomings. And so I think one of us is that his White House certainly did not appreciate the interplay between a movement and governing. And that the benefit to having a strong movement to expand the terms of debate than making them actually look more reasonable. And so I, I was at a meeting where I heard Rahm Emanuel basically say that. And so, um, so you have that reality. I think we saw it play itself out in the primaries. Is that when uh, uh, different Black Lives Matter activists took the microphone from Bernie Sanders, what it wound up doing is pushing the debate and educating Bernie Sanders and having him develop and incorporate the, the concerns and the issues of this movement into his electoral platform. And so there is that essential interplay which is necessary, and I would even say more necessary. And so that, I would argue, is what Trump did on the right, is he <clears throat> took the most extreme, right-wing, racist, xenophobic viewpoints and sentiments and built his candidacy on it. And that we did not counter that by rooting our movement, our, our, our campaign, in the, in, a, in the progressive movement in the similar regard. And then I think just two other things to, that I want to highlight in that regard. One is the, um, well, for one, I think it's an important point to make, is that people keep saying well, we lost progressive, we lost the uh, working class whites, and we shouldn't be, in it. Uh, my argument is we should not be chasing the conservative working class whites. And I think that what is left out of the analysis or underappreciated is that there are progressive whites. And there are progressive whites who have historically stood for racial justice and equality in this country, from the abolitionists, the civil rights movement, to allies of Black Lives Matters now. My argument is that that's actually enough people allied with people of color mm -hmm. to be, have a majority yeah. within this country. <laughs> and that we do have a majority. Right, so we I uh, create a website um, uh, that tries to put forth this analysis called Democracy in Color, and we put forward this analysis called Return of the Majority. Because I think that one thing we've we've lost is that the occupant of the Oval Office does not does not elected with the majority support and does not have majority backing for the agenda that he's actually moving. So we don't carry ourselves with the sense that he's an interloper <laughs> and yeah. we're the majority, when in fact majority, we won election by three million votes, there was a diffusion of progressive votes, and that allowed him to actually slip through. Um, and just the last point in terms of what's possible around how these things move together. All right, well, you're talking about uh, calling Obama a Muslim and a socialist. I used to be amused and think like, Oh, a large number of people in this country think that the president is a Muslim and a socialist, right? And so what that might mean uh, psychologically. But <laughs> I do think it was sig very significant to me that he had a, a, an explicit socialist run for president of the United States with very little backlash or re re you know, revulsion to his agenda. So I actually think there is a wide, much wider openness to a very progressive, if not actual, left policy agenda that is not fully appreciated in current U.S. politics. That's Steve Phillips, author of Brown is the New White. Joan Walsh, can you pick up on that and talk about something, uh, we've been talking mainly about white and black, but of course Steve's book talks about how, of course, Latinos is a big part of that uh, emerging demographic majority, and very fascinating data in your book also, Steve, about Asian Americans and Native Americans. I think it's about six to seven percent, which is, of course, in electoral terms, the difference between a nail-biter election and a comfortable win. Yeah. So, Joan, as you look at this, I mean, you, you cover daily politics uh, all the time for, for a lot of places, including the nation. Do you see any um, positive movement, any recognition on the part of the powers that be inside the Democratic Party of these kinds? Have they learned any lessons from 2016? Uh, yeah, I would say uh, some, maybe not enough. Uh, 
but I, I think that you know the work that Steve does is very important to just really do the math, repeatedly make them do the math. Uh, I guess what I would add, though, that's, that's unfortunate is we have to realize we don't live in a true democracy and that our power uh, as progressives, as people who live on the coasts, uh, as, as people of color, is intentionally diluted by the structures going back to the founding fathers and through voter suppression today, through the Supreme Court decision in 2013 gutting the Voting Rights Act. So. Uh, we are very disadvantaged uh, by these by these systems so that Hillary Clinton could win three million more votes. But our votes in California, I live in New York now, they don't count the same way that a vote in Idaho counts. Uh, and that is really troubling. Uh, and it does mean that we have to, I, you know, when I wrote my book, I, I just wrote something for the American Prospect that was kind of like, challenging my book, challenging myself, because part of my book, What's the Matter with White People, had several meanings. But one of them was, and I was very overt about this, what's the matter with white people? We need some of them anyway in our you know, multiracial progressive coalition. And I would still stand by that. Steve stands by that. But I think I put a little bit, I was a little bit too Pollyanna-ish about the possibility of strong, left-wing, progressive, pro-labor policies uh, to lure those white working class voters back. I say in this piece that's in the prospect, uh, I feel like I wrote a manifesto for Bernie Sanders, and then by the time Bernie Sanders came along, I didn't really agree with it anymore. Um, because <laughs> the, the, uh, the, the explicit racial appeal of Donald Trump pulled a lot of those people away. And to say, oh, if only Democrats or Obama gave them more, he gave them a lot. He gave them the auto restructuring. Uh, he gave them the stimulus in 2009, 2010. He gave them Obamacare, which has helped a lot of Trump voters. And that still wasn't enough. The appeal of race was stronger. Uh, and that chastened me. And I don't want to end on a, on a hopeless note, but that really chastened my, me and my optimistic thinking that the, the white working class, my people, uh, just need a stronger populist voice and they'll come back to the Democrats. That wasn't, that's not true. That's Joan Walsh, author of What's the Matter with White People? We're going to go to questions now. There'll be someone walking around with a, with a microphone. I want you to put up your hand, please, and we'll come to get you. And while we're waiting for that to happen, I'll just remind you that uh, these wonderful authors up here will be signing books later. Alicia, not quite, because she still has to write that book. But, um, you know, that's a snap. It just takes, like, 20 minutes. Just, you know. Uh, so that'll be back here in about 20 minutes, and uh, we're going to have about uh, that long to uh, ask questions. And the microphone is here, and I'll just remind people one more time. We're at the Bay Area Books Festival in Berkeley, California. This is the session on race and resistance in the Trump era. And our first question, please. I wanted to follow up on what Steve Phillips said about the asymmetry in the last election, that the Republicans are the party of white people. And Put the mic closer to your mouth, and, please. And uh, is part of the problem, in, in fact, that... I mean, the devil's advocate response to, to your position for the Democrats is that people of color, voters of color, are stranded because they only have one party that's not completely hostile to them. And that's the argument in favor of pandering to white voters because voters of color have nowhere else to go. So 20 years ago, I would have said the first, first black president would be a Republican. Doesn't look like that's going to happen now. So do, do voters of color need another party or another option? What's uh, Steve Phillips. Um, you know, you can always make an argument. I, I came of age in the Rainbow Coalition, and I've been on a mission that I still think it's the right and appropriate to, to take over the Democratic Party. And we're actually seeing different parts of that happen. There are going to be strong, progressive people of color running for governor of Florida, Georgia, Maryland, uh, Arizona in 2018. And so that's representing to me the next the, the level um, of leadership in that direction. The other piece I think that has to happen is we need political leadership and particularly campaign operatives and consultants who have cultural competence and comfort in talking about race. And so that is more of what the problem was. This person in the White House ran a campaign saying, white people come with me and let's take our country back. And the Democrats responded by saying, well, he's unfit. He's, he's untempered. He, he has a bad temperament. We did not draw a line in the sand and say, no, we're going to build a multiracial country that embraces and includes everybody. 
and summon white people to be better and to rise to their highest selves. And that when that did not occur, people were able to defect in, en in enough numbers to be able to, to, to send the election. If it's a question of him being temperamentally problematic, then that's something's wrong with him. If you define it as that's the campaign of the racists and the xenophobes, there's something wrong with you if you're with that campaign. And we did not have leadership in the Democratic Party and progressive movement able to make that argument in a way that is effective. Right. Thanks for a terrific panel. I think picking Hold up- Hold the mic closely to your mouth. There you go. All right, picking up on uh, your discussion about whiteness and, and white racism, I think part of the picture, and this is going back to Trumpism, beyond Trump, meaning before Trump and after Trump, has to do with a whole culture of entrepreneurialism tied to a defiant white identity. And, I th and Trump as capitalist folk hero, I think we really have to think about what that means, but it's beyond him, and should he disappear, Trumpism tied to a certain understanding of a certain ethos of capitalism, highly individualistic, cruel, relentless, um, is something that will last beyond Trump. And my fear is, in the future, another candidate will come along, not from discredited Wall Street, but perhaps <laughs> Silicon Valley. And I was just wondering what your thoughts about this melding by Trump but again, it's larger than him, of a kind of violent free market capitalism with a violent authoritarian racism. Alicia or Walter or anybody want to jump in? Go ahead. I don't know that there's much more to say, except yeah, that's possible. Well, you know, it, 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 it's so true, though. You know, it, it, people come up to me all the time. And they say, we, uh, we, we're going to get rid of him. We're going to impeach him. They actually think that's getting rid of him, and it's not. It's just the first step. But then, and then they say, but then, then we'll, you know, they'll, we'll get rid of him. And I'm thinking, so, yeah, so now you can have Pence. You know, like that would be nice. And then after Pence, you could have Ryan, and after that, Orrin Hatch. You know, uh, it's like the 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 idea. The idea. The the, the problem is, is is a much. It's a it's a, a problem inside the culture. You know, and you know when you talk about people like from 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 Appalachia or, or the Midwest that have to, to actually understand who and what they are and where they are in the world. That's one of the big problems. And you know, one of the things that one of the things that I that, that I've been talking with to Katrina Vanden Heuvel with is that a lot of times the nation does events in places like this, which is great, except for you know, you guys already think like this. I mean it's like it's ridiculous for us to be here. We should be in Omaha. We should be in Tennessee. We should be in Georgia. We should be talking to those people down there. You know, there's a lot of black and, and, and white uh, union people, uh, socialists and stuff that would, you know, could fill up a room like this in, in, in Mississippi, you know? Uh, we, we don't go there though. And like, you know, and that's a big problem, you know? That's a, that's a really big problem. And it's, it's one that, you know, I, Trump took advantage of. I, I hate to say that he was smart enough to do that, but he did do it, regardless if he was smart enough or not. And, and, and we need to, you know, I mean, we can act like him, but also we can just, we can act like, you know, civilized people and like talk to everybody. Talk to everybody. Who's next? Where's the mic? Uh, I'm looking around back for here. Uh, in the Can back. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Um, I want to know how do we, as progressives and uh, people who want uh, equality, how do we begin talking and educating about economic equality? And that actually, that's the only access. I mean, you you have to have access to economic security to be in the, in the game. And how do we make that available? And I'm speaking as a teacher, uh, retired now, watched all through the 80s and the 90s how a policy of diseducation has resulted now in over 60% in the state of California students are not reading at grade level. Uh, so education, I don't think it's a solution, but it's a means. And why isn't uh, uh, the Democrats and the progressives educating the whole population on their self-interest as, 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 uh, towards the economy and how you're gonna do something about that? Okay. Uh, Joan, you talk about that a lot in your book. Why don't you take that one? 
Yeah, I mean, some of it is that, you know, as our schools began getting less white and more black and brown and Asian, we either funded them less or, or we didn't, our funding didn't keep pace with the growth of, of the student bodies. Uh, and we, we just cared less, and that's just, that's just true. Uh, and it's very, very depressing. Um, I do think, I, I was not a Senator Sanders supporter in the primaries, but I give him a lot of credit for widening uh, what we talk about now, and that, you know, even bringing Hillary Clinton over to free college, up to $125,000, but that's a pretty good start. Um, I think that we're having a much uh, more robust conversation about single payer, which was, you know, not even on the table in 2009. The closest we came to it was discussions of the public option, which the president pretty quickly abandoned, uh, because, partly because the constituency for it didn't seem to be there. Now there are people who, you know, or, or see themselves as organizing for free college, organizing for uh, single payer, frankly, single payer, um, though there are a lot of ways to get there. Uh, but, you know, so I, I think that is something that you know, Bernie saw and that other people didn't see. And a lot of people, you know, are, are building on that realization and, and helping to um, make real in, in real policy terms, but also political terms, um, this opportunity, this moment when, when more Americans of every race, um, less white people, but even some white people, see the way we're getting screwed and that are, are you know, cutting back on our entitlements to uh, education, especially, w w you know, is just a terrible, shameful problem. Mm -hmm. We're going to go to another question in a minute, but Alicia wants to... Yeah, so, I, I mean, your question, I think, highlights a couple of things. One, to, f to get people together to figure out how to restructure an economy that can provide for everyone, we have to start at a starting place that the economy is racialized and gendered. And I think this was the the reason that Bernie Sanders didn't actually capture a lot of people in communities of color is because he wasn't actually speaking to the racial barriers that existed to the opportunities that he was pushing for. Uh, so that means basic things at a local level, like uh, you know, in Oakland, we just paid a million dollars um, to a survivor of sexual assault uh, at the hands of multiple police departments in the Bay Area. Um, that money and those resources could be going to things like summer job training programs for Oakland young people. Those resources, we spend 40% of our city budget, 40% of our city budget on policing, rather than 40% of our city budget in, in terms of making sure that people have access to the things that they need and bolstering the programs that actually support working class young people, working class people of color that support equity, gender equity, gender parity. Um, we have to start thinking about things in that way. I don't think it's enough to, um, it's, it's not enough to say let's, let's make sure that there's more economic opportunities without talking about how that, those segmentations happen. Uh, the other thing I would wanna say about this is that one of the things that I think came up for us in the 20, 2008 and 2012 elections uh, is, is not just that we had a, 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 a candidate for president who was um, culturally competent and being able to speak to various communities of color, but he was speaking to things that people really desired in their lives. Uh, so when you talk about uh, what it's gonna take to energize people to participate again, because I'll be honest with you, I don't think that we naturally are gonna have increased participation in this next election cycle. I think there's a, 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 a danger that people uh, are so upset about what's happening and so disheartened about their ability to change what's happening that more people could sit out, right? The way that we counter that is by really actually organizing, not just talking to people through TV screens like Steve has said, but actually talking to people about what it is that they want and deserve, and then activating people to do that, not just through voting for president, but reshaping the ways in which uh, our resources are being distributed at our city level and at our state level. That's a great place to start to exercise power and in fact uh, to be able to kind of be a model for what's possible around the country, right? We do still have a lot of 
uh, influence over what's happening in our cities and what's happening at our state levels. And I'm really excited for Trump to talk about cutting California off from federal funding. I'm excited yeah. about things like yeah. that because I think that there's an opportunity there to start to link up with other states like uh, New Mexico and like Washington State, folks who are trying to do progressive things and say, hey, let's actually do it differently. We don't need to wait for you. We just need to show, not tell, that what we're doing is better than what they're doing. That's Alicia Garza. She is the co-founder of Black Lives Matter, and she is the author of the forthcoming book, working title only, <laughs> How to Turn a Hashtag into a Movement. Look for that later this year. It's out from One World Random House. Next to her is Walter Mosley, the author of 56 books, including Folding the Red into the Black, uh, and a uh, just an eminent American novelist. I commend all of his books to you. Next to me here is Steve Phillips, Brown is the New White, another book. If you want to understand 2016 and 2018 and 2020, this is the book you need. Brown is the New White. And finally, Joan Walsh, author of one of the most provocatively titled books in recent years, What's the Matter with White People? All of those books will be signed back there by the authors when we're done. I'll just say thank you here on behalf of The Nation magazine. We're at the Bay Area Books Festival in Berkeley, California. This has been Race and Resistance in the Trump Era. I'm Mark Hertzgard. Thank you very much.